Your life isn't margaritas on a beach in, in Jamaica. That happens now and then. Those are exceptions. Your life is how your wife greets you at the door when you come home every day. Because that's like 10 minutes a day. Your life is how you treat each other over the breakfast table. Because that's an hour and a half or an hour every single day. You get those mundane things right, those things you do every day. You concentrate on them and you make them pristine. It's like you got 80% of your life put together. The perception that people have of ultimate success and ultimate happiness is, uh, it seems motivated by what they don't have, rather than an understanding of what success and happiness really is. Their, their idea is that one day I'm going to go and I'm going to be in my golden years and I'm just going to be able to sit around and do mm. nothing and tell everybody to fuck off. <laughs> You won't be well, happy I at all. A, yeah, I talked to, to, to one of the people that I was working with who had a, like a vision for retirement. I said, well, what's your vision for retirement? Well, I see myself in a beach, you know, some tropical country drinking margaritas. And I thought, uh, first, that's not a plan. That's a travel <laughs> poster. It's like, okay, let's, let's walk through this. All right, so you go down to this tropical country and you go sit on the beach and you have a margarita. It's like, okay, well, how many margaritas? Like 10? <laughs> okay, is it going to do that? What, going to do that for six months? You'll be dead. Yeah, well, you'll be this, like, pathetic, sunburned, like... Fat. Yeah, yeah. unhappy, yeah. hungover, cirrhotic. In pain. Yeah, yeah, it's like, that's Dehydrated. your vision. Dehydrated. So uh, how long can you have a margarita on a beach? Like, maybe you can do that once every six months for, like, ten minutes, something like that. <laughs> it's not a vision. It's true, but when you are working and slaving away, you think about that beach with your feet up, yeah. and, and the waiter comes over. Would you like another margarita, Mr. Peterson? Yeah. Yes, I would. Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, absolutely. all right, but baby. It, right, exactly. But it's it's like this 16-year-old fantasy of yes. paradise. It's like, well, yes. and it just doesn't work out. So yeah. And and the thing that the thing is is that the thing that sustains people through life really is the lifting of a worthwhile burden. It's something like that. Yeah. And it's partly because we're social animals, right? It's like we're evolved to be useful to the people around us because they're much more likely to let us live if we're like that. Yes. So, and, and it's been very fun talking to, especially talking to young men about this. It's like, well, and that's the other thing too, is I think the world, the world is full of darkness, let's say. And we could say each of us have a little bit of light. And if we release that light, if we let it shine properly, Christ, it's too cliched to go on with in some sense, but the world is a lesser place if you do not reveal from within yourself what you have to reveal. And the fact that the world is a lesser place actually turns out not to be trivial. Like if you aren't everything you could be, more people will die, more people will suffer, more evil will be unconstrained, more tyranny will reign, more chaos will remain chaotic and dangerous all of that do you mean this by this in the sense of like the old proverb of the wings of a butterfly fluttering become a hurricane it's 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 something similar to that but it can even be more local it's like your family is more messed up than it could be if you were less messed up than you are right so if you just got your act together like 10 percent more your family would be one percent better right it's like well do it and that would ripple off into that the would, people uh, that they inter yes. interact yes yes and, and it ripples and it ripples fast yes that's the other thing that's so cool is that like people think well there's seven billion of us and each of us is just this separate dust moat like floating in the cosmos and what the hell difference does it make what you do anyways it's like that is not how we're connected it's like you're the center of a network and you know well you know way more people than this but let's say typically you know a thou you're going to know a thousand people in your life well enough to have an impact on them okay and each of those thousand people is going to know a thousand people so you're one step from a million and two steps from a billion and we are networked technically that that's how human interactions work and so when you do something that you shouldn't do it's worse than you think and when you do something that you should do it's better than you think and so you think well this is why i've been telling people well, clean up your room it's like well your room is actually networked too it's not that easy to clean up your room, to set it. So you want your room to be set up so that when you walk in there, it tells you to be better than you generally are. It's organized, it's got direction, everything's in its place. You try to do that in a chaotic household. You know, I've watched people do this because I, I had students do these sorts of things as assignments. I'd say, look, pick a small moral goal, clean up your room, and just write down what happens as a consequence. So maybe these are students in a chaotic household the whole place is a bloody mess no one's taking any responsibility for anything and so they decide they're going to start to clean up their room 
And then the people in the household notice. Well, the first thing they do is get pissed off. It's like, who do you think you are? Like, you think you're better than us? You, like, why do you think this is worthwhile? Who made, who died and made you God? All of that. So just by trying to organize this little part of their life, they immediately run into the people whose actions they're casting in a dim light by trying to improve themselves to some degree. They might have to have like a thorough war in their household to be allowed to do something as simple as keep the room orderly. They find out very rapidly that A, that's way more difficult than it sounds, and B, that the consequences of it are far more far-reaching than people think. So that's quite fun. You know, because maybe part of it is, is that like everything around you is full of potential. Everything. Maybe more potential than you could ever possibly utilize. And so maybe all you have is this little rat hole of a room in some rundown place in the world. It's like, fix it up. There's more there than you think. See what happens if you fix it up. And you'll fix yourself up simultaneously because you have to get disciplined in order to fix up the room. And then you have a fixed up room and you'll be a more fixed up person. It's like, you think that nothing will happen as a consequence of that? It's like all hell will break loose as a consequence of that. It's That's really a, worth trying. It is worth trying, and it's it's a concept that seems alien to people. But if you think about it, it makes sense. Well, people don't take what they have right in front of them seriously enough. It's like the wasting time thing. They don't do the arithmetic. You know, and they, they also don't understand. They devalue what they have right in front of them. Like another, another client I worked with was having a hard time putting his kid to bed at night. And so we, we did the arithmetic. It's like, well, I'm fighting with my kid for 45 minutes a night trying to get him to go to bed. Okay, so let, let's analyze that. All right, so what does that mean? Well, it means that both of you end the day upset. That's not so good, because why would you want that? It means that you're spending 45 minutes fighting when you could spend 20 minutes doing something positive, like reading to him, say. It means that you don't get to spend that time with your wife, so she's not very happy with you. Plus, you're annoyed because you don't see her. Plus, you blame it on the kid because he's the proximal cause. It's like, that's pretty damn ugly. And then, and then let's do the arithmetic. It's like seven days a week, 45 minutes a day, let's call that five hours, 20 hours a week, 240 hours in a year, it's six, you're spending a month and a half of work weeks fighting with your four-year-old son. Think you're gonna like him? You don't like anyone you spend a month and a half a year fighting with. It's a bad idea. Fix it. It's important. Get him to bed, make it peaceful. You do it, like these things that repeat every single day, that's a motif in this book too. Your life isn't margaritas on a beach and in Jamaica. That happens now and then. Those are exceptions. Your life is how your wife greets you at the door when you come home every day. Because that's like 10 minutes a day. Your life is how you treat each other over the breakfast table. Because that's an hour and a half or an hour every single day. You get those mundane things right. Those things you do every day. You concentrate on them and you make them pristine. It's like you got 80% of your life put together. These little things that are right in front of us, they're not little. That's the first thing. They are not little, and they're hard to set right. And if you set them right, it has a rippling effect, and, and fast, too, way faster than people think. If you don't organize yourself properly, you'll pay for it, and in a big way, and so will the people around you. Now, and you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that, because if you're in pain, you will care about it. So imagine you're dealing with someone who's hoarding. Now, people who are hoarding are often older or neurologically damaged or they have obsessive compulsive disorder. But then you walk into their house and there's like 10,000 things in their house. There's, 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 there's maybe a hundred boxes and you open up a box and in the box there's some pens and some old passports and some checks and their, their collection of silver dollars and some hypodermic needles and some dust and, you know, a dead mouse and, 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 there's boxes and boxes and boxes like that in the house. It's absolute chaos in there. Absolute chaos, not order. Chaos. And then you think, is that their house or is that their being? Is that their mind? And the answer is, there's no difference. There's no difference. So, you know, I could say, well, if you want to organize your psyche, you could start by organizing your room. If, they, if that would be easier, because maybe you're a more concrete person and you need something concrete to do. So... You go clean up under your bed and you make your bed and you organize the papers on your desk and you think, well, just exactly what are you organizing? Are you organizing the objective world or are you objecting your field or are you organizing your field of being, like your field of total experience? And Jung believed that 
And I think there's, there's a Buddhist doctrine that's sort of nested in there that at the highest level of psychological integration, there's no difference between you and what you experience. Now you think, well, I can't control everything I experience, but that's no objection because you can't control yourself anyway. So the mere fact that you can't extend control over everything you experience is no argument against the idea that you should still treat that as an extension of yourself. So you could say, well, let's say you have a long-standing feud with your brother. Well, is that a psychological problem? Is that him? Is it a problem in the objective world? Or is, is it a problem in your field of being? And it's very useful to think that way, because you might ask, what could you do to improve yourself? Well, let, let's step one step backwards. The first question might be, why should you even bother improving yourself? And I think the answer to that is something like, so you don't suffer any more stupidly than you have to. And maybe so others don't have to either. It's something like that. You know, like there's a real injunction at the bottom of it. It's not some casual self-help doctrine. It's that if you don't organize yourself properly, you'll pay for it. And in a big way, and so will the people around you. Now, and you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that. Because if you're in pain, you will care about it. And so you do care about it, even if it's just that negative way, you know. Um, it's very rare that you can find someone who's in excruciating pain who would ever say, well, it would be no better if I was out of this. It's sort of pain is one of those things that brings the idea that it would be better if it didn't exist along with it. It's incontrovertible. So you get your act together so that there isn't any more stupid pain around you than necessary. Well, so then the question might be, well, how would you go about getting your act together? And the answer to that, and this is a phenomenological idea too, it's something like, look around for something that bothers you and see if you can fix it. So now you think, well, let's say, there, let's say you go into a, you can do this in a room. It's quite fun to do it just when you're sitting in a room, like a room, maybe your bedroom, you can sit there and just sort of meditate on it and think, okay, if I wanted to, spend 10 minutes making this room better, what would I have to do? And you have to ask yourself that, right? It's not a command, it's like a genuine question. And things will pop out in the room that you know, you like there's a stack of papers over there that's kind of bugging you and you know that maybe little order there would be a good thing. And you know, you haven't, there's some rubbish behind your computer monitor that you haven't attended to for like six months. And the room would be slightly better if it was a little less dusty and the cables weren't all tangled up the same way. And like, if you, if you allow yourself just to co consider the expanse in which you exist at that moment, there'll be all sorts of things that'll pop out in it that you could just fix. And you know, I might say, well, if you were coming to see me for psychotherapy, the easiest thing for us to do first would just be to get you to organize your room. You think, well, is that psychotherapy? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you conceive the limits of your being. And I would say, start where you can start. You know, if, if something announces itself to you, which is a strange way of thinking about it, as in need of repair, that you could repair, then, hey, fix it. You fix a hundred things like that, your life will be a lot different. Now, I often tell people too, fix the things you repeat every day, because people tend to think of those as trivial, right? You get up, you brush your teeth, you, you have your breakfast, you know, you, you have your routines that you go through every day. Well, th those probably constitute 50% of your life. And people think, well, they're mundane, I don't need to pay attention to them. It's like, no, no, that's exactly wrong. The things you do every day, those are the most important things you do. Hands down. All you have to do is do the arithmetic. You figure it out right away. So, a hundred adjustments to your broader domain of being, and there's a lot less rubbish and there's a lot less rubbish around and a lot fewer traps for you to step into. And so, that's in keeping with Jung's idea about erasing the dis once you've got your mind and your emotions together, and once you're acting that out, then you can extend what you're willing to consider yourself and start fixing up the things that are part of your broader extent. Now, sometimes you don't know how to do that. So you might say, imagine you're walking down Bloor Street and there's this guy who's like alcoholic and schizophrenic and has been on the streets for 10 years. He sort of stumbled towards you and, you know, incoherently mutters something. That's a problem. And it would be good if you could fix it, but you haven't got a clue about how to fix that. 
you just walk around that and go find something that you could fix because if you muck about in that, not only is it unlikely that you'll help that person, it's very likely that you'll get hurt yourself. So, you know, just because while you're experiencing things announce themselves as in need of repair, doesn't mean that it's you right then and there that should repair them. You have to have some humility. Your mind is a very strange thing. As soon as you give it a name, a genuine aim, it'll reconfigure the world in keeping with that aim. That, that's actually how you see to begin with. And so if you set it a task, especially, you have to be genuine about it, which is why you have to bring your thoughts and emotions together and then you have to get them in your body so you're acting consistently. You have to be genuine about the aim, but once you aim, the world will reconfigure itself around that aim, which is very strange. And, and it, it's, it's, it's technically true to see what you aim at. And that man, if you can get one thing through your head in, as a consequence of even being in university, that would be a good one. You see what you aim at. And so because one inference you might draw from that is, be careful what you aim at, right? It, what you aim at determines the way the world manifests itself to you. And so if the world is manifesting itself in a very negative way, one thing to ask is, are you aiming at the right thing? Now, you know, I'm not trying to reduce everybody's problems to an improper aim. People get cut off at the knees for all sorts of reasons. You know, they get sick, they have accidents. There's a random element to being, that's for sure. But, and so you don't want to take anything, even that particular phrase, too far. You want to bind it with the fact that random things do happen to people. But it's still a great thing to ask. You're going to have to put some effort into your life. And you need to be motivated to do that. And so, what are the potential sources of motivation? Well, you could think about them in, in the Big Five manner. You know, if you're extroverted, you want friends. If you're agreeable, you want an intimate relationship. If you're disagreeable, you want to win competitions. If you're open, you want to engage in creative activity. If you're high in eroticism, you want security. Okay, so those are all sources of potential motivation that you could draw on, that you could tailor to your own, you know, your own personality. But then there are dimensions that you want to consider your life across. And so we ask people about, well, you know, if you could have your life the way you wanted it in three to five years, if you were taking care of yourself properly, you know, what would you want from your friendships? What would you want from your intimate relationship? How would you like to structure your family? What do you want for your career? Well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job? And how are you going to regulate your mental, physical, mental and physical health? And maybe also your drug and alcohol use, because that's, that's a good place to auger down, you know, because alcoholism, for example, wipes out, you know, five to 10% of people. So you want to keep that under control. And then, and then, so maybe, you know, you, you, you develop a vision of what your life, what you would like your life to be. And that associates the, so the goal, well, once the goal is established, and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement, the micro processes become rewarding in proportion, in relation to their uh, causal association with the goal. And that tangles in your your incentive reward system. You know, we talked about the dopaminergic incentive reward system, and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward. And the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal. Okay, well, what's the implication of that? Better have a valued goal, because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the microprocesses associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. And so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day. You're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal. You, you do that. You do that in some sense as a unique individual. You want to, you want to specify goals that make you say, oh, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. Because the question always is, why do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. The question is, why would you ever do anything? And the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at how Look at what it is that people accrue that's valuable across the lifespan. Look, look what, so you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence and already did that. 
You need a family, you need friends. Like you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for you know, time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. You know, those are, that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's, that's, a, bad, that's a bad deal for you. Who it is that you're trying to be, right? And you, you, you aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And, and I really mean want to be. I don't mean should be. Even those things, those things are going to overlap. And it's important to distinguish between those because that's partly, and this is back down to the micro-routine analysis. So if I was saying, well, you're going to try to make yourself more industrious. Okay, number one, specify your damn goals. Because how are you going to hit something if you don't know what it is? That isn't going to happen. And often people won't specify their goals too because they don't like to specify conditions for failure. So if you keep yourself all vague and foggy, which is real easy because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't want to know when I fail because that's painful. So I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. So, so I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, it looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's going to be, you know, anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's going to be some suffering and loss involved in all of that, obviously. The goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, then, then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with a schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously, there's a bit of responsibility that's going to go along with that, because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're going to insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were that, than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, you just dig, you know, you dig yourself a hole and then you bury yourself in it. It's like, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that, just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you got to work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know. So maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself. Like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero, right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week, or 50.5% for God's sake, or because you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. Now, you know, obviously in the confines of the marriage, that's a terrible thing, but... That's a very uncomfortable subject, though, <laughs> for women in particular. Oh, it's an uncomfortable subject for everyone. Right. So you're a young man, mm -hmm. and all the women are rejecting you. Who's got the problem? It's not all the women. That's right. a bad road to go down. If all the women are rejecting you, 
It's you. We both agree on this, but why is enforced monogamy the solution for people that are involuntary celibates? Well, it's the solution to the it's the solution to the relationship between men and women. Fundamentally, is monogamous yeah, social norms. Yeah, but these norms. men are unattractive. If these oh, men well, are the unattractive, the solution to them. But if these men are unattractive to women, I don't mean just physically unattractive. I mean women aren't seeking them as mates. Mm -hmm. They need to become men. Yes, they certainly do. This is That's what it the is. solution. That's the solution. Absolutely, and we man. both agree on this. So, yes, but, but, but they need to do that in a society where monogamy is the social norm. But isn't That's it all. the social norm anyway? I don't think they're related. Quite honestly, I don't. I don't think that involuntary celibates. I don't think that having enforced monogamy as a part of our cultural norm is going to help those people. I well, really it does. don't. It does. How's it going to help them? Well, because what happens is if a polygamous society develops, mm -hmm. which is the alternative, then a small minority of men get all the women. That's what happens. Oh, okay, I and can so that, see that's that. All, that's the only point that I was making. In the theoretical world where polygamous societies exist en masse, and then you do have this problem where there's a, a small group of men that are all the women but that's not what we're talking and about. and also making the women unhappy right because the women don't have any access to a genuine intimate one-to-one -one relationship over any long period of time which so is it doesn't what work the women well. want it's the, the whole and, idea and, is and that what's best the women for want too. that right mm -hmm. sure if you have children right um but i don't i still don't think that that is why these men are involuntary celibates and i don't think it's the solution to that i think the solution is that they need to become attractive to yes, women. Yes, that is the solution. Yes. There's no doubt I don't, about that. I don't think the two are related. Well, the only the, I was making a minor point. The minor point was that one of the ways that societies around the world have figured out that you keep young male aggression under control is by enforcing monogamous standards because it gives everyone a chance in some sense. So that's it the only gives point that a I was chance, making. Meaning it, it clears more uh, more women will be available for one-on-one -on -one relationships. Yes rather than one guy who is some, uh, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, yeah, some well, you see large this, you figure see, in society. Yeah, well, you see this happening in, in universities where women outnumber men. So the, the men hypothetically have more sexual opportunity, but that isn't what happens. What happens is that a small minority of men have all the sexual opportunity. A fairly large minority of men don't. The women are unhappy because they can't find a committed relationship. It's bad for most of the men. And the men who have all the sexual opportunity get cynical. But isn't this in some ways against your whole idea of equality of outcome? Because you're, you're talking about equality of sexual outcome now. That's the <clears> dominant <throat> basketball player that just kicks everyone's ass. This is, the, this, this is a guy who succeeded at the highest level, right? Well, there's going to be people like that sexually. Huh? There's going to be people that are better at finding mates, and that this is what they enjoy. They enjoy having many mates. Yep, they enjoy term. being... Yes, but... But if this is what they enjoy, if it's mm -hmm. a man who doesn't want a family and enjoys dating multiple women, mm -hmm. why is that bad? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I think the fundamental reason it's bad is because it's bad in the long run for children. It's bad for children yeah. if he chooses to have children. Yeah, well, that that's it. But, that, but that's it. That's, but that's the fundamental it. issue as far as I'm concerned. The problem with hierarchies is that they can get too steep and destabilize everything. Right. That does happen. That particularly happens in the sexual domain. And there's plenty of anthropological evidence for that. But you still might say, well, who cares? Because the men who are, who are winning should be allowed to win and the women should be allowed to choose. It's right. like, yes, except that there's the problem of children. And so society steps in on behalf of the children. And you can say, well, lots of people don't want to have children. And yes, and that's truer now than it used to be, although many of those people end up having children anyways. You know, the guys who are sleeping yes. around all the time, so that doesn't circumvent the problem. But the issue here for me isn't the men or the women, it's the children. And we're trying to set up societies where the probability that children will be raised in something approximated in an optimal environment is optimized. And that's going to mean sacrifice of opportunity and choice on the part of adults. It's I, necessary. I agree with you, but I think that what we're talking about mirrors what we're talking about in sports. It mirrors what we're talking about in business. It's everything else. There's, there's going to be people that are better at all different aspects of life. There's going to be people that are talented in terms of like getting women to like them. Yes, that's and, true. Well, that's why also, look, you see this. Right. Women are hypergamous, which means they mate, up and they mate across and up dominance hierarchies. And so yes. if you're a male who's successful in a given hierarchy, the probability that you're going to have additional mating opportunities is exceptionally high. It's an unbelievably good predictor of that.
that hypergamy is a very uncomfortable discussion. Yes, some it people. certainly is. It's it very doesn't uncomfortable. Matter. Well, there's plenty of uncomfortable yeah, discussions to be had. That's a big one, though. It is. The, the idea that it defines women's sexual choices by the fact hmm. that they want beggar, bigger, better. Hmm. They want well, someone who's more, okay. more successful, hmm. someone who's so, so higher on the social ladder than what they're accustomed to or what they have Yeah, now. well, what women do is, that, like, mate choice is a very difficult problem. So how do you solve it? Well, here's how women solve it. Throw the men in a ring, let them compete at whatever they're competing at, assume that the man who wins is the best man, marry him. Yes. It's a brilliant solution. It's a market-oriented solution. It's actually the solution that appears to have driven our evolutionary departure from chimpanzees. It's a biological solution. It, it's it a would, biological it would, solution, it would but it has a cost. The, what is the cost? Well, the, the, cost is, the cost is polygamy. Is polyamorous, is a polyamorous society just as unattainable as this utopian Marxist yes, idea? Yes, I think so, because societies tilt towards monogamy across the world. It's human universal. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't have polygamous or polyamorous tendencies, because they certainly do. And it's certainly also the case that one of the women, ways that women gerrymander this system is that, say you're married and you have children with your husband, but you also have an affair. So you have a child by another man. That's more common than anyone suspected. So part of the way, re way that women solve the problem that you're just describing, and I'm, and I'm not saying anything for this or against this, this is a purely factual biological claim, is they pick a monogamous marriage and they cheat with high status guys. Now, you know, obviously in the confines of the marriage, that's a terrible thing, but that's a very uncomfortable subject, though, <laughs> for women in particular. Well, it's an uncomfortable subject for everyone. Right. But, but it's a but terribly women uncomfortable they, subject. They don't like the idea that this is a common thing, hmm? that women choose a safe man that hmm. is willing to be monogamous with them and perhaps maybe they're above him in a social class or in uh, sexually, and then they'll cheat with yeah. someone who is yeah. above well, it's them. Well, com it's common, but it's not the norm. Right, it's still right. the norm not to do that. The norm right. is fidelity. Right. But but there's plenty of exceptions. And this is enforced monogamy, culturally, yes. the norm. This yes. is the, well, the, the very definition Well, enforced of it. monogamy is this. It's like, okay, so my son's getting married in, in September. And so, so let's say he comes to me in a year and he says, hey, Dad, guess what? I've had three affairs in the last year and they've all been successful. I haven't got caught. Aren't I a good guy? What am I going to say to that? No, what the hell are you doing? That's not what you're supposed to be doing. That's enforced monogamy. Enforced monogamy meaning the people around you try to guide them in a way that you think is going to lead yes, to it's, a it's, harmonious it's, family Yes, life. it's built deep into the cultural norms, and if that yes. starts to destabilize, then there's trouble. And that doesn't mean that it's not prone to all the problems that you laid out. Look, there isn't a bigger problem than successful reproduction. It is the big problem. And all of the solutions that we've generated for it are full of flaws. If we had to make a bad drug legal, the worst choice was alcohol. Yeah, and the funny thing is, if you're trying to stop drinking, you need something better than alcohol. Mm -hmm. And alcohol is pretty good. Yeah. So you better find something a lot <laughs> better, man. Yeah, and, and it is. And then esteemable people do esteemable things. It's like, yeah, well, you want to figure out you want to figure out something that you're doing with your life that's worth not getting drunk and screwing up. Yeah. Right, because that's fun. You might say, well, why do people drink too much? It's like, if you like alcohol, that's a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's like, why do people drink too much? Well, because it's great. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, so why stop? Well, you do stupid things when you're drunk. You hurt yourself. You, you compromise your health. It's really hard on the people around you. You tend to turn into a liar, and it screws up your life. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah, well, it is, but you need something better than that. And what's better isn't being straight and, 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 and not making mistakes. It's like that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm -hmm. better is, no, you need an adventure, man. You need to get out there and have something to do yeah. and, and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. Actually, the addiction is the substitute for that, if, if truth be known. I'm sure this must have happened when you decided to stop drinking. You must have thought this isn't good. I'm not going to be funny anymore. I thought that. I okay. thought I thought there was going to be ramifications. Yeah. Okay. And so, what were they? What what do you, what did you what did you foresee happening? I thought I wouldn't be funny. I thought that people wouldn't like me. I thought that um, I wouldn't be able to meet girls if I wasn't drinking or you know or having drugs or. Right. So that was things. what you were afraid of giving up if you stopped drinking. Right. What were you afraid of happening if you kept drinking? I was afraid of 
not achieving my dreams. I was right. afraid of ending up a drug addict. I yeah, was so of, hurt, okay. of dying in my sleep. Something you know, dying under the influence. Okay, so there, so there, yeah, it's not like that doesn't happen to comedians. Right, it happens a lot. Yeah, it's one right. of our, dude, it's one of our, it's one of our go-to well, moves. Right. Well, right, exactly. <laughs> well, it's on an occupational hazard because you're up late at night and you're around <laughs> bars all the time. It is, it is, because it is it, 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 because you're up late at night and yeah, you're Chris Farley right here. Right, right, exactly. Well, and it happened to all sorts of comedians and rock musicians. It usually happens at about twenty-seven. So okay, so you were afraid. You were afraid you're going to die. Are you afraid you're going to become addicted? So, so let's say what what of life? What would have life like been like you for for you if you were addicted? So you don't have a career anymore, no, right? So you've given all that up and failed. So that's fun. So that's going to drive you even more <laughs> yeah. towards drugs. Yeah, it would have been all my dreams. It would have been miserable. Right. It would right. have been so, hell. Exactly. Is that so? Why quit drinking? So I don't end up in hell. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's a reason. There's a reason to stop. And then if you make that hell real, it's mm -hmm. like here's all the details of my personal hell. Yes, let's avoid that. Right. So then you have something to run the hell away from. Right. So now you to have something towards. towards and something to run away from. And I'll say this too, as you, for if there's any young men or women out there who are listening to Jordan feeling like, well, I still, I don't know if, you know, if I start doing something different, like my friends are going to act a certain. Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But you're right. also, you're going to start creating conversations. You're going to become the intrigue because you're going to be bringing something new to the table. And you're also going to find out who your friends are. Yeah. Because if you're starting to put your life together and you have friends that object, those are not friends. Those are just people you know. They're not friends because a friend is someone, this is one of the hallmarks of a friend. Here's two hallmarks. Mm -hmm. A friend is someone you can tell bad news to and they won't tell you why you're an idiot and they won't interfere with your suffering. They'll just, they'll, just, they'll just listen and maybe they'll suffer along with you. Mm. Okay, so you can tell bad news to them and they won't tell you some worst thing that happened to them. They'll listen mm. and they'll suffer along with you. But a friend is also someone you can tell good news to. And the friend will say, wow, in this veil of tears, something good happened to you. Great, man. Congrats. I'm wonderful. It's rare. It's unlikely. Good for you. I hope 10 more things like that happen. And they're not envious and they're not jealous and they're not one up in you. And if you're trying to get your life together, it's actually, if you're trying to get your life together and your friends get in the way, that's actually real useful for you because you've now identified who your friends aren't. Mm. And you might think, well, I can't give them up. It's like, oh, yes, you can. And not only can you, you should, and it would be better for them because if they're aiming down and they want you going down with them, there's nothing good about what's happening to them, and there's certainly nothing good about that for you. Yeah, they're not going to, and then they're going to learn, wow, if I, I'm going to lose friends if I continue in these directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, exactly. Do, is it hard for, why is it hard for people to let go of what's so familiar with to them, even if it's bad? Well, because it's complicated, you know, and the thing, that's a really good question. You discount the risk of familiarity that they're familiar mm. with. So like, let's say... Because people are in relationships. People are in relationships with the drugs and alcohol. People yeah. are in relationships with humans. People are in relationships with jobs. People are in relationships mm. with their own selves. And they live, they're live. they living a lie every single day, but it's, yeah. it, it's familiarity. Yeah, well, you say, I have a job I hate. It's like, well, yeah, but I'm not dying from it. It's like not as bad as it can be. So you, you kind of, you factored in the risks already. They get invisible. You think, well, I can't jump out of this job because what about all the risk? It's like, yeah, no kidding. You got to make a... You got to get your resume in order. You got to send it out. You got to send 50 of the damn things out before anybody will call you back. Then you have to go get interviewed and maybe you're not any good at that. You have to come up with a story while you're a good employee and maybe and maybe you're not yet. So you have to figure out how to do that. It's like, what about all these risks if I go look for a new job? It's like, yeah, absolutely, man. Those are risks and they're harsh and no wonder you're avoiding them. What about the risks for you to stay with this job you absolutely hate? Mm. Well, let's think that through. Okay, so I have this dead end job. I hate it. I'm getting bitter. Where am I going to be in five years? I know where, because I've watched this with people. You're going to be just like you are now, except a lot more of what's good about you is going to be gone, mm. and a lot more of what's terrible is going to be amplified. And you're going to be like, in five years, you're going to be 10 years older instead of three years older. Yeah. Right. And Because so, it kills your spirit somehow. Oh, man. Yeah. So it's like, you think, oh my God, there's a terrible risk in pursuing this new job. It's like, yeah, there is a terrible risk. There's a terrible risk in you staying with your job right now. And so one of the things that's re really freeing to understand is that you're screwed no matter what you do. Ah. There's no secure path forward. Give it up. It's risk everywhere. You think, mm. oh my God, that's terrible. It's like, yes, except for two things. You can pick your risk. That's the first thing. So you get to pick your poison. That's ah. something. And second, you're a lot tougher than you think. Mm. So even though there's risk everywhere, if you confront it forthrightly, what you'll find is that you can actually handle the risk. And that's the security. If you really like alcohol, it does it does 
two things to you. It makes you more extroverted and mm -hmm. enthusiastic while you're on the ascending limb of the blood alcohol curve, which is why you have to keep drinking mm -hmm. once you start. Because if you plateau, that yeah. goes away. So you've got to keep drinking. Okay, so that's one thing. It makes you more enthusiastic and, and more full of positive emotion. And the second thing it does is reduce anxiety. Yeah. And so if you are a bit more socially anxious and you also have that positive response to alcohol, which everyone doesn't have, by the way, then it's a great drug. But the problem is it's, well, it's a great drug for the moment. Right. <laughs> right. There's there's consequences. Yeah, the sounds know, when it's not great. Well, it, it also, alcohol is an interesting drug because it, it, it actually doesn't make people stupid. This has been tested. Like, people who are drunk will take far more risk. And you might say, well, that's because they're too stupid to understand the risk. It's like, no, they're not. If you ask them about the risk when they're drunk, they can outline it perfectly. Mm. What it stops them from doing is caring about the risk. It's actually, and that's part of the anti-anxiety components. Like, yeah, the risk is, that's why you can drive around drunk at high speed in a car, which is really stupid thing to do yeah we used to do that in the back roads of northern alberta it's fun yeah you know but but people died all the time doing <laughs> it especially in the winter it's like yeah. wow this is great it's great until your head's gone through the windshield you know like so many things <laughs> yeah you know? it's like jumping off a cliff it's i'm flying which is true <laughs> until the last one tenth of a second it's like then you're not flying man it's yeah. like yeah yeah so so alcohol alcohol has exactly that effect it is a great anti-anxiety drug but it does stop you, and he said it stopped you, from learning the skills that you need in a social circumstance to be able to cope with that. Mm -hmm. So then it actually stops you from dealing with the anxiety. Mm -hmm. You don't have to learn how to overcome it. That's not good. Yeah, and alcohol also makes people aggressive. It's the only drug we know that actually makes people aggressive. Mm. So you see a massive effect on crime rates because half the people who murder someone are drunk. Oh, yeah. And half the people who are murdered are drunk. <laughs> And, you know, and you're most likely to be murdered by a family member. Yeah. So I've been joking with my audiences. is like, well, if you really want to get killed, the best thing to do is go drink with a family member. <laughs> yeah. So, which is actually statistically true, which is terribly, terribly <laughs> comical. Crazy. It's like, yeah, go get drunk with your family if you want to die. <laughs>